technology is almost never neutral. Uh, and data collection is an exercise not in neutrality, it's uh, constructing knowledge. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the summer edition of Forum 2000. My name is Didi Kirsten Tatlow. I'm in Berlin. And uh, today we're going to be talking about data technology, essentially, and really fascinating issues to do with surveillance and um, the person, if you like, and who owns whose data. And our guests are Ulysses A. Mejias, who is Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Director of the Institute for Global Engagement at the State University of New York, a college at Oswego. And Xiao Tiang, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of China Digital Times and an adjunct professor at the School of Information, University of California at Berkeley. So we really um, are touching here upon a, a huge uh, issue. It's, it's absolutely fundamental to how the world is shaping going forward and how we as people, as citizens um, and as individuals uh, experience that world and, and how life will really be. And um, of course, uh, very interestingly, um, some time ago, we had a book, uh, Mr. Mr. Mejias and uh, his fellow, his colleague, Nick Cooldry, who's at the LSE in London, published a book called The Costs of Connection, How Data is Colonizing Human Life and Appropriating it for Capitalism. Um, of course, Data, this data issue, the appropriation of data, the colonialization, if you like, of our bodies, of our minds, isn't just something that is happening within a one particular economic system, the capitalist economic system, which we associate with the so-called West um, and, um, and uh, with the United States primarily and also many other places, of course. Um, but it's also happening in China differently, in some ways the same um, and of course, there's a whole set of other political issues to think about when we come to China. And this is really the issue that we would like to tease out today um, is the similarities and differences with data colonialism, uh, if you like it, between these two great forces, um, the United States and China. So I thought perhaps we could begin um, by turning um, to Mr. Mejias for perhaps just a really tight introduction to the concepts that you're exploring in this really very fascinating book. And uh, then we'll ask Mr. Xiaotiang about, you know, how China sort of feeds into this and how we should understand it. So I think essentially, um, Mr. Mejias, could you start with simply just briefly introducing and correcting anything that maybe I said that wasn't quite right and something you'd like to, um, to give a great idea for people of what they are, of what, course. what they can be thinking about. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be having this conversation with you. And so, yes, as Didi mentioned, um, Nick Coldry and I have written a book um, called The Cost of Connection. And the main thesis really, we're talking about an emerging kind of colonialism that we call <clears throat> data colonialism. And so let me give you the definition for that. We define it basically as an emerging order for the appropriation of human life so that data can be continuously extracted from it for profit. So we're not saying that all data is bad and all data extraction is bad. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, we're focusing specifically on data from our lives that is extracted for profit or for surveillance. Um, so basically we're saying, whereas the old colonialism focused on the extraction of land, the appropriation of land and of labor, this new one focuses on uh, life, what's being appropriated is in fact our life, um, abstracted of course through the medium of data. And we do argue that in fact, there are two colonial powers in this new order, the United States and China. And they're both engaged in this kind of extraction, perhaps of course, for different reasons. Um, Silicon Valley is mainly interested in profit. Um, the communist, party of China is, of course, interested in control. But uh, uh, there's a lot of overlap, we argue, because in essence, 
we're talking about the same technologies uh, to monitor what the citizen does or what the citizen says is also uh, um, part of monitoring what or can be used to monitor what she buys. So um, identifying, for instance, potential terrorists is uh, can be done by using the same technologies to identify potential buyers of an exercise bicycle or for a smartphone. So we're talking about the same infrastructures being in place uh, that we find in China as, uh, as well as in the rest of the world. Let okay. me just make two very brief points about mm -hmm. this colonialism idea because it might sound strange to call this data colonialism because after all, we might say colonialism is over. So we are not making a one-to-one -one comparison. We are saying that there are important differences in terms of the modes, the intensities, the scales of the contexts, but we're saying that there is one very important similarity between the old colonialism and this new colonialism. And that similarity is the function. We're saying the function of all colonialism and data colonialism is the same. That function is to extract. Right. Yeah, um, really vivid concept there, I think, data colonialism. We're familiar with the extraction of, for example, silver or oil or uh, anything really. And now, of course, it's information and in our brains and our bodies. Um, so, Xiaotiang, could I turn to you and ask you to perhaps address this issue of the fundamental similarities or differences um, in this concept of data colonialism when it's applied to um, the US and China. What, from your point of view, uh, is China doing and how is it similar or not to what's happening in the US? Sure. Um, now, there are many uh, theoretical framework trying to help us to comprehend uh, what we are fa uh, facing, experiencing uh, the, the transition of society. And many years ago, we heard we are the age of internet, now we're age of connection. We are the era of information, uh, we're era of a big data. Uh, now we say we are uh, entering an era of artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. These are uh, all describing certain aspect of our economic, social life, uh, even political life, that how it's being shaped by the new tech technology. Uh, using uh, data colonization is a useful concept that I would uh, uh, can now help to ask uh, the who's a, a colonizer, which uh, um, the previous speaker actually answered, right? The China and the US are the two powers. Uh, who are the ones being colonized? Um, natives, who are the natives? Us, right? Every consumer, every person who living in this Datalized society in the in the datalized uh, economic infrastructure. We're using the product. We are uh, using those apps. We're making transactions. We're buying a uh, app or buying a uh, even refrigerator or a, a car or a, um, a speaker. You know anything at the Internet of Things that connected producing data. We all become data producers. U.S and China and increasingly the rest of the world. Why we say US and China? Because China now starting from a very manufacturer based economy in the past 20 years, I quickly developing the uh, digital economy. Uh, US um, sort of internet penetration, the mobile network penetration, uh, the uh, digital economic applications are pervasive in the society. Uh, it is the largest digital economy in the world. Uh, it's, it's expecting to be in many ways, almost on par of United States Silicon Valley and a certain particular aspect such as uh, facial recognition, the uh, identification uh, tracing uh, using artificial in, uh, intelligence are even surpass, um, surpass United States. So in this context, let me say two things about China. Um, one, and in technology, uh, uh, using the information and, and tracing and tracking and transaction communication that uh, can micro-targeting individuals for commercial profit-driven uh, purposes uh, from the large corporations or from the government, from the state for the control and surveillance purposes. Secondly, uh, those 
uh, technology not only being used for micro-targeting uh, individuals, they can also use for large-scale pattern recognition and a prediction for the social trend. Uh, for, and that, again, it can be used both for economic purpose, for the large corporations, and for the state. Uh, that uh, can control and mobilize uh, implementing certain policy goals to its own population uh, using this type of technology and the data they can extract. Finally, I just say one thing, which is a uh, difference between United States and China is uh, US, those companies are private companies. Uh, they have, they functioning within their limit of uh, law, uh, privacy law, or other uh, sort of infrastructure, government uh, um, uh, power counterbalance that they can pursue for their profits. But in China, Communist Party firmly control the entire state apparatus and firmly control the all private businesses. If they want access to any part of the data, they want to apply technology to any those data that private business or state-owned enterprises collect from Chinese consumers or the consumers, as a matter of fact, anywhere in, in the world, they can. They don't have the barrier between. That's the difference between a surveillance capitalism and a what I call the digital authoritarianism. Right. Gosh, yeah, fascinating. I mean, the concept of everyone as a native of some kind is really, really, um, it's really disturbing, um, but it's also very powerful, I think, and really frames this whole data issue so <clears throat> wonderfully. And then, of course, this very clear distinction that you draw, Xiao Tiang, um, between how things operate in the US and how things operate in China. I'm just wondering if um, either of you would like to say anything about the recent um, scandal, if you like, on the U.S. stock exchange with Didi Chuxing, the uh, IPO of um, the ride-hailing app known as China's Uber, so to speak, um, where in fact it was essentially there was involvement from the state after the IPO. As Xiao Chang mentions, um, you know, the state can basically do what it wants, one way or the other. Um, and does does this, in some way, kind of provoke new ideas or new thoughts um, about where we're going with data. And when we look at the different um, ways that the US government and the Chinese government handle uh, this issue of particularly here with this example of Didi Chuxing. I wonder if I want, Mr. Mejias, perhaps you could uh, take yeah. that first. Yes. Well, Xiaoqiang made a very interesting point, which is in some ways we are all subjects or natives in this new order of colonialism. But something Nick and I try to be very careful about is also to differentiate, because even though we're all natives, some populations are paying a heavier price under this system. And those populations are the ones who have been traditionally oppressed under older forms of colonialism. So in the United States, of course, we see surveillance measures being applied to African-Americans, Muslims, etc. And I think this is uh, uh, one point where uh, the example of China becomes very illustrative too, because this surveillance apparatus is uh, geared towards also the uh, persecution and oppression of ethnic minorities, including Uyghurs, of course. So um, the technology, I think, uh, in China and the United States is the same, but it's true that in China it's being applied to focused on a very specific group of people. The danger, of course, is that the technology being the same, uh, other countries can follow suit and you use it in similar ways. Of course, after 9-11, uh, ever since 9-11, we've seen also the focusing targeting of uh, special specific populations in the United States and in the West. Um, but I thought it was very interesting um, that, for instance, there was a recent tech, tech crunch report that um, uh, discovered that at least 100 counties, towns and cities in the United States have purchased Chinese-made surveillance systems. Uh, made by Higvision and Dao, Daohua, yes. uh, that the U.S. government has linked to human rights abuses. So that's my point, that because the technology can be used to target specific populations, even the United States is using it in similar ways uh, um, 
uh, that the right. Chinese are using it. Yeah. But, but, you know, I think I think the political aspect here we should address a bit more thoroughly, which is what is the possibility of pushback? Because that seems to me to be the ultimate function of the individual within a society is whether or not they have the political rights to push yeah. back. Um, but, now, in China, it's clear that people don't because it is a um, it is a it's a top down system. It's a dictatorship um, in the United States. What what Mr. Mejia's? Well, how would you assess the state of the ability to push back against this kind of data surveillance, data extraction, data colonialism? Well, of course, there are important differences. And one of them, uh, um, as Xiao Chiang was saying, is yes, corporations in the United States are held to different standards. Uh, in China, of course, the state can control what the corporations do. do. Um, but uh, I think it's also very important to keep in mind that um, in the United States, for instance, um, states and cities have taken action. So for instance, right now, the state of Maine recently passed um, uh, an order, LD1585, I believe, which restricts the use of facial recognition technology. So Maine, the state of Maine in the United States has the most stringent, stringent uh, regulations against facial recognition. And this is something that we couldn't see for a, in other uh, scenarios such as China. Of course, we also have other states like Washington that have passed other laws that make it possible for um, uh, the police, for instance, to use um, facial recognition. Interestingly, that law in the state of Washington was drafted by Senator Joe Nunkian, who is also a Microsoft employee. So, you know, it's very complicated uh, the way in which uh, money and um, power uh, intermingles even in Western democracies. Right. So, Xiaoxiang, I wonder if I could draw you back to the issue of Didi Chuxing and this massive data trove that... Um, sort of almost improbably, I think, launched yeah. on the New York Stock Exchange yeah. and then was kind of pulled back by the government. But How that do you is, see that, that playing yeah. in here? Yeah, That is the latest example of yeah. the Chinese uh, government trying to control those large tech companies. Uh, we probably all remember not too long ago, uh, Alibaba, uh, Jack Ma, uh, uh, his company, uh, Ant uh, 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 Group, that uh, a, a fintech uh, a giant being uh, pulled off uh, uh, from the, the going on the market for the similar reason under the state. What's happening here? Uh, the Didi Chuxing is a sort of Chinese version of uh, Uber or Lyft uh, company. Uh, uh, in the past a few decades, uh, a typical tab, uh, uh, pattern is that there is some innovation, a new business model happening in Silicon Valley, United States, and quickly being uh, copycatted in China. But then soon, it's not simply a copycat. It's adopted the China state sort of marketing situation, and it's growing at its own momentum, at its own advantage, uh, becoming a, its own tech giant. And in some ways, some, sometimes uh, even uh, better than their original copy. Uh, WeChat is an example. You know, uh, it's a combination of Facebook and Twitter. And Didi is a sort of copied idea from uh, uh, Uber and Lyft. Uh, but soon became a real tech gi uh, giant uh, in China. And also we need to remember this, right? Those technologies include extracting all our data, but also providing society as such a convenience service. Uh, Uber is example, Didi is another. Now greatly improving Chinese people's life in many ways. But now we're talking about the data. Uh, this and technology, when internet started, we, you know, as, as uh, the people who uh, uh, chair the, this new technology, cheering for the empowering fact, the empowering the ordinary users, uh, equalize the, the playing ground. Uh, but the new generation technology with the big data and artificial intelligence, uh, it's in favoring those large corporations and state who only them can have a capacity to extract those data, to proce uh, process such data, and to use this data for their own purposes. Ordinary users only contribute to their data, behavior data, personal behavior data to those cor corporations without getting much other benefit other than being micro-targeted as a, either a uh, you know, uh, uh, online ad or a, a sort of com uh, as a commercial uh, a target or a, a political control target. Now back to DD Chuxing. Um, 
those big corporations growing so large and so big, the data they're gathering potential is so powerful that Chinese state needs to put a firm control on it. The Chinese Communist Party is worried about those tech companies growing too powerful, even uh, uh, not, you know, uh, achieving, uh, pursuing their own agenda, not so much aligned with the state agenda. So Chinese party has trans everything, trying to set up, uh, establish party committees inside of those companies. They force those companies to have this 1% share called veto share, state has it, and it can veto them. Now they can put a slash regulation slash on them to say either anti, uh, uh, anti um, uh, the, the monopoly or other reasons just to keep them to, uh, uh, under more compliance for what state regulations ask them to do, particularly about how they do with data. So the whole thing is about power control. Who really control those data? Uh, uh, if the tech company has it, state want to have much firmer hands over those companies. And that's what happened to Didi. That's what right. happened to Alibaba. And yeah. some Chinese tech company will be the next. Right. And we're actually looking at similar movements in the United States, aren't we? we are, there is a certain support in Congress, even bipartisan, I understand, um, towards regulating big tech companies, because there's a fundamental idea in America that monopolies aren't good. You know, this is the this undermines the basis of capitalism, which is supposed to deliver uh, more opportunity to to everyone, really. I mean, that's a whole economic argument that one could debate, I'm sure. But I'm wondering if and we're actually, unfortunately, approaching the end of our time. And I, I wondered if we could try and um, distill this issue into and relate it directly to politics and to say, are, is data per se a threat or is it a question of the political system in which it is embedded? W what are we actually talking about here? I wonder, uh, Mr. Mejias, perhaps you'd like to start with that here. Sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's very true what some people say, that there is no such thing as raw data. Data always, um, uh, the mere fact of collecting it implies an intention and what you do with it, how you analyze it, to what ends you put it to work, so to speak, implies an intention, a political intention. So I think that's why we're seeing that um, um, you know, we tend to think that technology is neutral. And I always have long conversations with my students to try to get them to move from that position because technology is almost never neutral. Uh, and data collection is an exercise not in neutrality, it's uh, constructing knowledge. So uh, um, the application of this data is always a very political um, exercise which is also why we say in the book, one way to resist it is through imagination, through creativity. I do think civil society needs to put pressure on governments to regulate these companies, um, but we also need to, in some ways, decolonize data, um, decolonize the time and the space that we spend using these technologies, and also look at ways of resisting. Uh, based on how other people have resisted colonialism through 500 years to learn lessons from those movements, because I think we do need to question the very essence of what it means to collect data continuously and extract it from our lives. Yeah. Xiao Qiang, is there, is there a way, this, this fascinating concept of creativity and imagination is being pushed back against um, data tyranny, if you like, even, um, to maybe go on, you know, a slightly different direction from the idea of data colonialism. I mean, it can be a tyranny as well. Um, and, you know, these, these words, creativity, imagination, to me, they, they speak of, a, of, a, of a quite a free society. Now, I know that there's lots of creativity that goes on in all kinds of societies, but I'm wondering, within the Chinese context, is there, to what extent, is there the ability to push back? And does creativity, imagination, is that going to be able to do enough to that, that resist this very, trend? Very fundamental question. I, I agree with uh, Professor Mahir say that technology is not really neutral. A certain technology, certain type of technologies in favor of certain type of social players, political players, or economic players in the society. In our case, unfortunately, the datafication, the big data and the large artificial intelligence type of technology right now is in favor of a centralized controllers, in favor of large corporations, in favor of dictatorship, unfortunately. Uh, the, the China has an advantage of 
uh, uh, lack of privacy protection of the data extraction and the state of monopoly of the old power, therefore can use uh, uh, the data vacation of the society for its not only economic purpose, but also political purpose. Now, what's at stake and what's fundamental? Imagination, creativity at the root is a human agency that do are we an, uh, autonomous and have an agency responsible for our life and uh, can have a right to participate in the decisions to affect, which affect our own life, or we are just a subject of another entity, a colonizer, another form of power through such a uh, 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 old uh, uh, comp comprehensive uh, technology, right? It is very difficult for individuals or even to uh, consumers or, or citizens to push back the state and large corporation with such a technology power uh, under this infrastructure, unless there are the political changes, unless there's a counter power, uh, not only from an individual level, but from a larger infrastructure or even international order level and the society different classes, there's some kind of alliances can be made to resist uh, uh, such a, so you can call it colonization, the, the repressive infrastructure imposed upon uh, individuals, particularly in the countries that uh, uh, with autocratic uh, political mm. system. And, you know, um, for last question, please, to both of you, how can we do that? How can we offer that essential resistance? You talked about perhaps new international order, the concept of that. It, one thing that <clears throat> strikes me is that people are not just subjects here, people are also objects, right? Where they are objects, if you like, of dictatorship, of data extraction, of tyranny. So this is um, really profoundly human and profoundly important question. What, what can we really do about this? In, for example, in China, Mr. Xiaoqiang, if you wanted to start, I mean, how, does, how do we even begin to manage well, this this one, problem within Chinese, have, uh, within but, a Chinese situation. Uh, the, the, to s start because uh, the one way to do it is uh, first of all, we do have a real good standard to protect data and private uh, the uh, privacy and to sort of uh, set up a right political order in the economic order in the society, in the democratic society, such as the United States. The uh, U.S. companies needs to. Uh, live up that kind of a standard uh, instead of simply pursuing the, the, the profit uh, through this data vacation. Secondly, uh, it need to be able to compete with the Chinese tech companies and, and the Ch uh, Chinese system, which uh, can you know, get the data cheaply uh, without much uh, private protection, which are training their AI programs uh, 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 with better accuracy, better prediction, and produce uh, more knowledge about the population, therefore produce more power for the corporation and state. That is a threat that unless the democratic world who holding the higher sort of a human uh, freedom and, and the human values can produce technology, uh, pr not only protect those values, but also can compete with the authoritarian use of the technology. Otherwise, uh, uh, our uh, world is heading towards uh, lesser and lesser freedom under yeah. this technology. Yeah. God, it almost, almost makes one wish that Google hadn't ever been invented, frankly, when I listen to you speak. <laughs> It's, it's kind of where it came from, I guess, but that's evolved very highly since. And again, it's a question of intention. But listen, Mejias, I wonder if you have any closing remarks you'd like to make on on, on what we've been talking about and in response to Xiaotian just now. Yes, thank you. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Google because I think it's easy to imagine a Chinese subject who doesn't have options, who is being oppressed. But how many of us in a Western democracy can live without Google? or live without Amazon, I think we become dependent and addicted to these companies in very different ways. And uh, again, I don't mean to completely equate the two scenarios, but I think we do have to look at our own situation as well. Uh, as far as colonialism, it's true that, uh, yes, imagination uh, is very important because when colonialism couldn't be resisted with the body, it could always be resisted with the mind. And I think even during the most um, uh, oppressive regimes, uh, people could always resist 
through the creation of culture. People are resisting right now in China uh, through their minds. It's just difficult to see it in the media. And again, the situation is very different, but I do think culture, the production of culture always goes on. Um, there are market forces at play as well, because as uh, Xiao is saying, you know, if the Chinese companies want to compete at some point, maybe they will need to look at their privacy um, options and how the technology operates outside of China. Um, but again, let's keep in mind that under the previous administration in the United States, the government was talking about creating a clean network, a network where the U.S. and the allies would um, be able to use clean apps, clean internet, clean technologies, which basically meant uh, nothing that is Chinese made to create this uh, uh, cocoon, this special clean network. So I think we need to look at both sides. I think we shouldn't assume that our position in the West is, uh, it is privileged in many ways, but we do need to also be engaged in the creation of this decolonization movement. We need to create perhaps a non-aligned technologies movement. After the Cold War, many nations, non-aligned nations, decided we don't want to follow capitalism, we don't want to follow communism. I think today, many people are in the same position. We don't agree with the model for profit model of Silicon Valley, and we don't agree with what the Chinese Communist Party uh, is doing. We need to find this third space uh, for the rest of us. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today to discuss this um, deeply fascinating um, issue of data colonialism uh, by the United States and China and the differences within it, how it's politically embedded, the need for creativity, imagination, response to push back, to maintain our humanity and our um, own ability to act. Um, it's been really fascinating to hear, and I feel like this is something that you know obviously needs more than a than a, a short discussion, and I'm I'm hopeful that we'll have something of that another time. Thanks very much.